Hello and welcome to this Airy Scientific Beta webinar with Dr. Felix Goltz, our Research Director with Scientific Beta. Today's topic is entitled Concentrated versus Diversified Indices, and we're going to compare these two approaches to single factor index design. At the end of the webinar, we will also be taking questions from our viewers. So if you do have a question for Felix, please send it to us by email at webinar at scientificbeta.com. OK, Felix, so let's begin. So can you tell us uh, what exactly are concentrated and diversified factor indices? Yes, so there are two uh, very different approaches to designing an uh, index that uh, is supposed to tilt to a given factor. Okay. So if you think about the objective um, of a, a factor index, um, the objective, of course, is to emphasize stocks with certain characteristics. So if you have, say, a value factor index or a momentum factor index, mm -hmm. you want to emphasize you know, stocks with a high value score or stocks with a high momentum score. Um, and so relative to a broad cap-weighted index, um, you're typically going to use a kind of stock selection to actually select the, the, the right stocks with the right um, factor tilts. Um, and you may also use a weighting scheme that you know, will be different potentially from simple cap weighting. Um, so, so there's this um, objective of obtaining a factor tilt. And then if you look at how these tilts are implemented in the industry, uh, there are these two very different approaches. So first of all, you have concentrated indices. So concentrated indices typically in terms of the stock selection, mm -hmm. uh, the provider tries to have a relatively narrow stock selection. So in a broad universe, say, you know, a typical larger mid-cap universe, you will typically select, say, only the top quintile stocks, the mm -hmm. top decile stocks. So relatively few stocks that have the highest score with respect to the, the desired factor. Um, and you even have index offerings that, you know, go beyond that and may just, you know, select, say, f the top 50 stocks or the top 100 stocks. Um, you know, a fixed number, relatively low number of stocks uh, that have the highest, uh, the, the highest factor score. Um, so this will lead to relatively concentrated portfolios okay. um, in the stock selection phase. Now you have a second phase, which is the weighting phase. So you have to choose uh, a weighting scheme in that index. Uh, so typically in the more concentrated indices, providers actually do not include a specific um, objectives in terms of creating a well-diversified portfolio. Um, they simply use weighting schemes like simple cap weighting, for example. Okay. And so simple cap weighting um, actually leads to relatively high weights in actually a, a, a low number of stocks. Mm -hmm. So typically the largest stocks have a disproportionately high weight you know, relative to the, to the smaller stocks. Uh, so even simple cap weighting leads to high concentration. Um, some providers also use uh, a factor score-based weighting. Uh, so rather than using the simple market cap, for example, they would uh, adjust the market cap weight again by the factor score. Mm -hmm. uh, so in addition to selecting stocks by the factor, you can use the factor score to tilt the weight also towards the stocks that have the highest factor score. And that, of course, increases you know, concentration um, even more than you know, simple cap weighting. Okay. Um, and so this is the approach used in, in concentrated indices. Um, now, how about diversified indices? Well, diversified indices have the same objective in terms of factor tilt. Uh, so, you know, the objective will still be tilt to value, tilt to momentum or, or a similar factor. Um, but you maintain an objective of diversification. Um, and so by, n by, by the nature of a factor tilt, you know, in a way, the objective is to emphasize certain stocks. But in the more diversified approaches, you're actually doing that in quite a mild way. So at the weighting, uh, at, at the stock selection decision, you're actually going to have a relatively broad stock selection. So you can obtain a value tilt, say, by selecting half the stocks yeah. that have the highest you know, value um, factor score, the lowest valuation metric. Um, and that will still give you, uh, you know, a reasonable value exposure, but will actually maintain uh, you know, a very large number of stocks uh, in your index. So that's at the, the stock selection level, you can have a broad stock selection. Now, at the weighting scheme level, again, instead of using simple market cap weights mm -hmm. or score-based weighting, um, you can use weighting schemes which actually try to improve diversification. Uh, so, you know, a simple example would be an equal-weighted approach, but you could have other uh, weighting schemes uh, 
alternative weighting schemes, so non-cap weighted approaches that try to obtain diversification. And, and these weighting schemes, you can apply them independent of uh, the actual factor score. Okay. So if you have selected the right stocks in terms of factor tilt um, at the first step, at the stock selection step, you can actually use any weighting scheme to improve diversification at the, the second step. So these are the two types of approaches that we have and you know they correspond to approaches that are widely both widely used in the industry as well. Okay and as you say they're both widely used but they're quite different so why have index providers come up with such opposite um, approaches of implementing factor factor tilts? Yeah so the the, the reason behind this uh, these different approaches is really that um, they are both related to quite different investment beliefs so you know you have to think about what do you actually want to achieve with that given factor tilt? Mm -hmm. um, and so you can go back to the, the, the basics, really. Why do actually these indices tilt towards factors? And why do you know, certain investors decide to tilt to you know, a, a given factors, such as value, momentum, and, and um, other factors? Um, and so the idea behind this is simply that by tilting to these factors, you can actually get a higher expected return mm -hmm. than by holding you know, the average stock, if you will, of the, 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 the broad market. Um, containing all the stocks um, and this is really kind of the fundamental insight from the academic literature um, you know on, on uh, asset pricing uh, so this literature has actually shown that there are certain factors that are rewarded and so that carry a premium gotcha. um, and so this is really the reason to tilt now um, what do we know really about this problem of you know improving expected returns mm -hmm. uh, through tilting towards factors well um, this is a question of you know, improving expected returns. So you're actually bringing in information in, into the index construction on the expected returns to different types of stocks. And now we know that estimating expected returns, mm -hmm. you know, is extremely hard to do. So this has been known for a long time. Uh, there's a famous paper by, by Robert Merton in 1980 um, where he talks about uh, the problems with expected return estimation. And, you know, the kind of the bottom line is that um, estimating expected returns is, you know, extremely difficult. Mm. Um, even if you have a lot of data, um, you're never going to get, you know, a precise estimate of expected returns. And kind of the reason behind that is simply that, um, you know, uh, statistics um, doesn't really, if you will, uh, improve the estimation of expected returns. So if you improve, say, the amount of data that you use, the, 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 the frequency that you use, you're trying to, you know, have more and more high frequency data, mm -hmm. it's actually not going to help you to get a best, better estimate of expected returns, simply because uh, you know expected returns are basically based on your observer price at the, the end point and a price at the start point. So you're basing your estimate on two points. Um, so you don't have a lot of data. Of and, and you know even if you kind of make it more high frequency, uh, you're not going to solve that problem, which is very different for risk estimation. For risk estimation, you know having more high frequency data actually helps. So with uh, expected return estimation, we have this problem. It's, it's difficult to do. More data doesn't necessarily help. Um, Fisher Black in 1993 has published an important paper also on this topic. Uh, so what this paper basically discusses is that um, you know, it's very difficult to estimate expected returns. Uh, we need decades of data actually to do that with mm. kind of any degree of reliability. Um, and in addition, if we're trying to get estimates at the stock level, not just at kind of a broad level in terms of group-wise expected returns, but we're actually trying to get precise estimates at the stock level, make differences between individual stocks, um, you know, we're picking up a lot of noise and, you know, these estimates at, at this fine grain level, at the stock level, are not actually likely to be uh, very reliable. Okay. Um, so this is really kind of the background to um, expected return estimation. It's very difficult to do. Um, now we can do it with factors, so that's mm. you know much better than just observing past returns. But still, we're faced with this problem that you know we're dealing with information on expected returns, mm -hmm. um, and so these concentrated and the more diversified approaches, um, you can really interpret them as you know um, providing different perspectives on this problem of expected return estimation. So if really you consider all these problems with expected return estimation, um, you know, you would conclude that all we can really say is that, you know, there are very kind of broad brush differences and across groups of stocks, uh, we may be able to, you know, come up with information that tells us what the differences are. And so, you know, at this uh, portfolio level, mm -hmm. um, we can perhaps make differences. And, you know, a lot of the empirical literature that has documented these premium in the first place follows just that approach. So, you know, they come up not with uh, stock level uh, tests of these premium, but really they group uh, stocks into portfolios and they okay. show that broadly, you know, across different portfolios, 
uh, these differences actually exist. So if you have a kind of um, you know, conservative mindset and you think that um, you know, it's quite difficult and we're quite limited with respect to what we can say mm -hmm. about expected returns, well, you would actually prefer a broadly diversified portfolio. Um, you know, you're not going to pick up any individual um, kind of stock level differences in, in, in risk. You're going to diversify them away by actually you know, holding a broadly diversified portfolio, but still you're just going to broadly tilt uh, towards a given factor. So basically this reflects, this, this diversification approach reflects that you think that on average, you know, across perhaps hundreds of stocks, mm -hmm. um, there are differences in expected returns and you can identify them with, you know, simple factor scores. Okay. Uh, but at the individual stock level, you won't actually be able to make these kind of distinctions. Now, uh, the, the, the more concentrated approach precisely is based on the idea that you know, the differences that you make in terms of expected returns, the, the differences that you can attribute, uh, well, they're actually quite precise. And, you know, if there really was, say, a completely deterministic link, so we would know that a higher factor score means a higher expected return, mm -hmm. you know, then it seems like a good idea to tilt towards the stocks that have the highest factor tilt. And, you know, in the limit, you would only hold perhaps a handful of stocks, mm -hmm. and in the limit, only one stock. Um, and so if you have the idea that, you know, you're quite confident in terms of making distinctions on expected returns, and you know this, um, these differences are, are quite reliable, uh, then you would actually favor um, a more concentrated approach. Okay. Now you mentioned a lot of the empirical literature and asset pricing theory. Have have you actually tested what you've just um, been talking about, and what have you been your findings in terms of performance across the differences uh, in these two approaches? Yes, yeah, so we've actually run um, empirical tests, and okay. I can present some of the results. Um, so what we did, um, and, and, and we published this in, in a recent paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management, um, we actually looked at six popular factors, okay. um, and so these correspond to you know, fairly consensual factors. Uh, so we basically chose, uh, you know, three factors from the, the Carhart uh, factor model. model. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are basically the size, the, the value, and the momentum factor mm -hmm. um, that, that we look at. We also look at a low volatility factor, which is, uh, you know, equally kind of well documented of and course. widely used. Um, and we also looked at two factors, which are, um, you know, so-called quality-related factors. So there's a, a, a profitability factor and there's an investment factor. So mm -hmm. across these six different factors, we actually constructed portfolios that are either diversified or concentrated, and we mm -hmm. just compared the, the results to, 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 to these uh, portfolios. So um, what we did is we took basically uh, simple proxies mm -hmm. for you know, what is a diversified factor index, what is a concentrated factor index, and then we, we, we tested the results. Um, so you have some results on, on this slide. Um, and what you can see is, is clearly that um, you know, if you take a starting point um, of a relatively broad stack stock selection and to use cap weighting to, to get a factor tilt, you can actually see that these factor tilts on average, they, they do add value. So this okay. kind of just confirms that the factors we took, they have you know, positive premium. Mm -hmm. um, so the first result is, is basically that, you know, if you just look at the top 50% of stocks, you, you cap weight those stocks, they, they're the ones with the highest factor score. Well, on average, you get an improvement of the Sharpe ratio, for instance, um, that goes from 0.44 um, uh, 2.55. So you see this increase, which reflects the, the factor premium. Um, now, this is a kind of very basic approach to, to designing a factor tilted index. So the question then is, can we actually do better by concentrating more? Mm. Um, and so we actually narrowed the stock selection down to 20% of, of stocks. And, and you can see the result in, in, in the slide. So if you stay with cap weighted um, and you narrow down the stock selection to 20%, you can see that the Sharpe ratio basically doesn't change. Yeah. So you get a very similar level of the, the Sharpe ratio, you know, it's 0.58, very close to the, the, the previous result. Um, and this suggests that really concentrating more and, you know, holding less stocks mm -hmm. that are more exposed to the factor doesn't actually add value mm -hmm. in terms of risk-adjusted returns. And if you look a little bit further, what's behind this result is basically, yes, by getting a higher factor tilt, you increase. Uh, average returns, but you also increase volatility. And so there's actually nothing to be gained in terms of risk-adjusted returns. Um, so this is the, the, the first result. Then uh, a second question we ask is, well, what about the weighting scheme? So is, are there any gains from looking at a better diversified weighting scheme? Um, and just as a very simple proxy, we looked at simple equal weighting. Okay. Um, so you, know, you may use other weighting schemes, but uh, we just uh, looked as a base case at the simple equal weighting. Um, so when you stay with a broad stock selection, 50% of stocks, and you move from cap weighting to equal weighting, you actually get 
quite a pronounced increase in the Sharpe ratio. So it goes from 0.55 to 0.66, okay. again on average across these six factors. Um, and so we get a pronounced increase in terms of um, you know, risk-adjusted returns uh, when you actually improve diversification with an alternative weighting scheme. Um, now, again, you could ask, well, what if I stay with this equal-weighted approach and I could use more concentration in terms of stock selection on top of that. So we also looked at a, a, a stock selection of the top 20%, but then used equal weighting. And you see that, well, relative to using 50% of stocks, you know, there's nothing to be gained. The Sharpe ratio is pretty much identical. Um, on, on, on the other hand, if you compare equal weighting versus cap weighting at this 20% stock selection level, you again find that, you know, even at this uh, more narrow stock selection, moving from cap weighted to equal weighted um, actually adds value. So there's a kind of very consistent result that uh, concentrating more doesn't actually add any right. value on, on a risk-adjusted basis, uh, but actually using an alternative weighting scheme actually adds, adds value in terms of performance. Okay. Uh, now performance is, you know, is, is one thing, it's important, mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's a relevant question, uh, but of course you also have to think about implementing these portfolios. Of course. Um, and we have quite interesting results I in terms of implementation as well. So okay. we looked at you know, simple implementation metrics. Um, so the um, uh, most interesting one is probably the, the turnover. Mm -hmm. um, so if we just consider the turnover, uh, we can see that, well, all of these uh, factor indices, they do generate, of course, additional turnover with respect to, you know, the broad cap weighted index. Um, but turnover for the broadly, for the broad stock selections um, is actually quite well behaved. So whether you use cap weighting or equal weighting, uh, turnover is in the area of 30%. Okay. Um, turnover, so um, you know that's that's relatively reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's interesting to see what happens when you narrow the stock selection, um, and when you narrow the stock selection to 20%, uh, you can actually see in our results that the turnover increases to almost 50%. Okay, okay. so you have an increase from something like 30% to almost 50%, so quite a dramatic increase in turnover. Increase. And I mean, just keep in mind that in terms of risk-adjusted returns, you're not gaining anything, mm -hmm. right? So you're adding turnover, Without but you're not gaining. Anything anything in terms of better uh, sharp ratio, for example. Oh, okay. um, so this is quite a, quite a strong result. Um, another interesting finding is what happens when you equal weight instead of cap weight. Mm -hmm. So we always have the, the, the two comparisons. Um, and it's interesting to see that equal weighting in this case doesn't actually add much turnover over, over cap weighting. Uh, so this is contrary to, you know, sometimes uh, beliefs that, that um, you know, people have about equal weighting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, in a broad index, you know, equal weighting instead of cap weighting adds uh, adds a fair amount of turnover. Yes. Now in our factor indices, um, just keep in mind that th most of the turnover actually comes from how the stock selection changes over time. You're mm -hmm. you know, selecting the stocks that have the highest factor mm -hmm. score and that changes over time. So whether you equal weight or whether you cap weight actually doesn't make a big difference in okay. terms of the, the, the turnover. So you know, equal weighting uh, has only slightly higher turnover than, than cap weighting. Um, and it has, you know, no severe implementation issues even by other measures which, which we looked at. So you can see that um, equal weighting actually does increase the Sharpe ratio, does increase the performance, um, and is quite well behaved in terms of the, the implementation challenges. Okay. And so you mentioned these results in terms of um, implementation, performance. Have you carried out any sort of robustness checks or is it, what's been the most striking thing from your results? Yeah, so we looked at um, several things actually to go a little deeper with okay. respect to these results. Um, and there's, you know, a range of things we looked at, but, uh, you know, among the most interesting, um, the first question we had was really, um, you know, uh, get a little bit, m you know, get some more explanation of why we observe these effects. Mm -hmm. um, and we looked at kind of a breakdown in terms of, uh, diversification effects versus other effects that, that we have in these different um, indices. Uh, and we also ran, if you will, more traditional robustness tests okay. to see whether these findings hold quite generally or you know, whether they are somehow specific to the, to the, to the test setup. Um, so on the question of, of diversification, um, so there's an interesting finding that we have and, and you can see the results in, in, in the slides. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, a reasonable question is, well, okay, if you improve by you know, uh, selecting uh, more stocks and equal weighting them, um, is that you know, simply due to better diversification or are you not you know, implicitly picking up some other factor tilts? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you could imagine that there's quite different um, exposure, for example, in terms of momentum when you use equal weighting rather than cap weighting. Uh, there could be differences in terms of the size exposure as well. Um, so what we did is we actually adjusted returns in a, in a Carhart model. Okay. Uh, so this model contains notably the size, the, the, the value, the momentum factor. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the residual risk and return. 
And so we came up with a measure of the diversification effect, which is simply uh, what is the, um, the kind of residual average return divided by the residual uh, standard deviation. So kind of a risk return ratio in terms of you know, residual um, returns that are not explained by the factors. Uh, and we see that this kind of diversification effect, so the, the residual um, average return or alpha divided by uh, the residual risk um, is actually systematically higher for the equal weighted versions, you know, compared to the cap weighted versions, so okay. that, you know, you can see that, um, you know, the improvement um, is not explained, if you will, by different exposures to other factors in the, in, in the card mm -hmm. model, um, but there's actually an additional effect, and um, we can kind of measure that with this diversification effect. So that 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 was the first uh, mm -hmm. finding. Um, I in terms of in terms of um, the robustness of the results, uh, we also had this question of well. 50% and 20% you know, were reasonable proxies for us, but of course you could argue about the precise numbers, why take 20%, why not 30 or 10% to, to come up with a, yeah, for a proxy of something uh, concentrated. Um, so to look at these kind of um, issues, we actually conducted the, 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 the tests across a whole range of stock selections, going you know, all the way from 95%, mm. so holding most stocks, just excluding the, you know, the ones with the most adverse factor adverse score, if you will all the way to being very concentrated, selecting only 5% of the stocks. Okay. And we show that our kind of key results um, really hold very kind of smoothly, monotonically, if you will, uh, across these different stock selections. So um, if you look at this, this uh, graph on the slide, you can see that um, kind of the first result was, well, concentration doesn't help in terms of uh, improving the Sharpe ratio. And so effectively, if you look at um, the results here, if, if you look at, you start at 50%, which is in the middle, and then you move further to the right, yeah. you're going to get more and more concentrated. Well, we looked at results at this 20%, um, at this 20% uh, spot. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you move beyond 20%, so you select even less stocks, uh, well, you can see that the results hold, mm -hmm. so the sharp ratio doesn't improve. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also see, interestingly, at some point, if you select, say, only 10 or 5% of, of stocks, you even get an adverse impact on the Sharpe ratio. So what happens here is that, you know, you're really starting to accumulate idiosyncratic risk mm. more than the actual factor risk. So yes, you're tilting more to value and momentum mm. if you hold only 5% of the stocks, but in the end, a lot of the risk in a portfolio like that um, is actually going to come not from the, the factor tilt, but actually from, you know, stock-specific um, issues, for example. And, and, and so at some point, the Sharpe ratio even becomes uh, negative, and mm. so that you know very much illustrates the um, kind of the, the, the general idea that uh, you know concentration uh, comes with problems in, in, in these factor tilted indices. Um, and you can also see the results in terms of turnover. So okay. what we saw was a quite a pronounced increase in turnover. What happens if you concentrate even more? Well, you know this increase in turnover, as, as you can see on the slide, mm. um, is almost exponential. So if you move to even higher levels of concentration, you know you're going to go yeah something like sixty percent. Mm. Um, turnover in, 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 in some cases. Okay. Um, I another issue we were interested in is, well, okay, we looked at equal weighting. So equal weighting is a proxy for a well-diversified weighting scheme, a well-diversified portfolio. Now it's a very kind of imperfect proxy. It's a very naive way of diversifying a por portfolio. It serves as a base case though. It, it, it is a base case mm -hmm. and, and so it's interesting to analyze. Uh, but in practice, of course, typically what uh, people would like to do is, you know, when you think about a diversification method, um, you're thinking of incorporating risk parameters as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you would like to run actually a, a portfolio construction method that takes into account the volatility of the different stocks, perhaps the correlations across stocks. Um, and so we also tested these risk-based weighting schemes. Okay. We actually uh, chose uh, a method which we refer to as diversified multi-strategy. Okay. So rather than looking at a specific uh, risk-based weighting scheme. Mm -hmm. We looked at a combination of five different weighting schemes. Okay. So this uh, is shown on this slide. It starts with, um, you know, maximum deconcentration, which which is similar to equal weighting, and then we move on to different risk-based weighting methods. So um, you know, minimum volatility is one of them, okay. um, and we're using uh, in total five different weighting schemes, and we're just averaging the the weights across them. Okay. Uh, and our question was, well, with this diversified uh, multi-strategy approach. Do we actually get the same results, or you know, do the results change? Um, and so we tested this different type of proxy for mm -hmm. um, a well-diversified portfolio. The results are shown here on, on, on this slide. Um, so we're looking at this broad stock selection with 50% of stocks, okay. um, and we're looking at not just equal weighting here, but also this diversified multi-strategy weighting scheme. And what you can see is that in terms of the uh, risk-adjusted returns, um, you actually get slightly better results 
than with uh, simple equal weightings. If you look at the um, you know, Sharpe ratio and information ratio, mm -hmm. um, they actually increase uh, you know, from about 0.66 to about 0.7 in, in, in both cases. And so um, this kind of risk-based weighting scheme actually you know, confirms the result that you can add value on, on, on cap weighting, mm -hmm. um, but it's even you know, slightly better than using simple equal weighting. Um, again, you can look at uh, implementations. So if you look at turnover, we get quite similar levels with diversified multi-strategy, mm -hmm. um, you know, using these um, risk parameter estimates in, in this kind of uh, methodology, um, you know, doesn't actually increase turnover over uh, simple equal weighting. Um, and also, if you look at the diversification effect, um, so we have these, these uh, measures that we discussed before, mm -hmm. um, if you look at the, the annualized, um, you know, average return uh, on top of the, the, the the factor return, you divide that by the residual risk, mm -hmm. um, you get an even higher measure uh, when you do this for diversified multi-strategy okay. than, than for equal weighted. So um, using a different type of um, weighting scheme mm -hmm. uh, actually just confirms our results and shows that you can you know, do slightly better with a um, less naive uh, methodology. Okay, interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Felix. Um, well, I guess that concludes the first part of the webinar. Uh, we're, going now, we're now going to be taking some questions that were emailed to us earlier. And so the first question we have is, um, so does a similar issue exist for fixed income? Because we're looking at equity and indices. Um, so does that exist for fixed income, for example? Uh, yeah, so I mean, j uh, just to clarify what we looked at, we simply looked here at uh, equity factor mm -hmm. indices. Um, and so we looked at uh, results across these different factors. Um, now, you have a similar issue with fixed income indices. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people um, may wish to tilt towards certain types of factors in fixed income. Mm. So there's relatively recent discussions on how to do that with, um, you know, these kind of factors like momentum and, you know, other types of factors. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, um, you know, a kind of, uh, there are traditional factors in fixed income, uh, like credit risk, yeah. like, uh, you know, the, 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 the term premium mm -hmm. uh, that people may want to tilt to. And uh, you have a similar question, right? So if you want to tilt towards uh, high credit risk uh, bonds, for example, yeah. um, why are you doing that? Well, you're doing that because you believe in the, 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 premium. the premium. There should be a, a credit premium. Um, and, and again, if you strongly believe in that premium, you know, you may just wish to tilt as, as much as possible and hold very few bonds mm -hmm. by kind of very few issuers. Um, so you have a similar, you have a similar issue. Um, of course, if you if you tilt towards very few bonds from uh, very few issues, mm -hmm. you know intuitively you know that you will not just pick up credit risk, mm -hmm. um, kind of the broad aggregate market credit risk, but you will actually pick up the individual credit risk, if you will, and, and you know other types of firm specific risks of these issuers. Okay. Um, and so I think there is, from a conceptual uh, standpoint, you will have exactly the same question. You would have at some point to think not just about tilting towards these factors. Uh, but actually you would have to think also about uh, using a diversification method. So we haven't actually tested this, so I can't you know, give you empirical results. Mm -hmm. uh, but from a conceptual perspective, you know, the issue um, is, is quite similar and you know, would be interesting to, to test. Okay, so conceptually it should be the same. Mm. Okay. Um, and another question we have was uh, related to crowding. So have you analyzed crowding effects from, for concentrated and diversified indices? Because with crowding, if uh, investors are selecting the same stocks, the, the premium they're seeking could disappear. So what can you tell us about crowding and how it affects these indices? Yes, okay, so, so um, you know, a crowding risk um, it comes up a lot in kind of recent discussions and, and recent debates. And of course, you know, it's, it's uh, quite intuitive to think that, well, you know, if lots of investors tilt towards these factors, right, what's, what's actually gonna happen? Um, in terms of uh, the premium of these factors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, it's interesting to make a distinction here precisely between these two types of indices, mm -hmm. uh, so concentrated and, and more diversified ones. And, and if you think about the risk of uh, crowding, um, well, the risk of crowding um, you know, is, is an understandable issue with very concentrated indices. So if really you believe that um, you know, lots of investors will actually um, you know, invest uh, large amounts of money into very concentrated indices that, you know, all tilt towards the same factor mm -hmm. um, or a limited number of factors. Uh, well, if these indices are highly concentrated, uh, very few stocks, then you would actually um, think that, you know, at some point you could have an effect on the price of these stocks and, you know, clearly there's not a lot of capacity in kind of very concentrated um, indices. And mm -hmm. so, you know, lots of investors may end up actually trying to, to, to buy and trying to hold 
uh, kind of very similar portfolios of, of kind of very few stocks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could um, imagine that, uh, you know, a crowding risk um, would actually matter potentially in, 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 these types of, um, in these types of index strategies. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about more diversified strategies, um, you know, it's not clear why crowding should occur in, in strategies that actually holds hundreds of stocks, of a large more number of stocks, um, because you are more diversified, so you're spreading out the weight more evenly, and so you should be less exposed to crowding. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at our illustrations here, so we looked at uh, we looked at indices that select 50% of stocks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a typical developed universe, uh, you know, if you like, you select 50% of stocks, you would come up with, you know, probably close to a thousand stocks, uh, typically at least hundreds of stocks. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not clear why, you know, there would be crowding if, you know, investors tilt towards Some very diversified stocks, portfolios with, with, with hundreds of stocks. It's, uh, you know, perhaps more of a risk if they all tilt to portfolios that only have, say, 50 stocks. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, and are much more concentrated. So um, I think I in terms of uh, crowding risk, there isn't much empirical study of, of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, there isn't actually any, if you will, empirical uh, evidence that you know, crowding uh, exists. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also ask whether it should exist in the first place if all of these factors um, are just premier for taking on additional type of risk, mm -hmm. then you know, there's no reason why there should be should crowding. Be crowding. Okay. Uh, but Clearly, if, you, if you're concerned about crowding risk, um, I think you know, it's important to make a distinction between very concentrated indices, mm -hmm. you know, potentially they would be more exposed to this of type course. of issue, and very diversified indices, which kind of by construction wouldn't expose you to, to crowding risk okay. to the same degree. Okay, so for those that are concerned about crowding, it's more pertinent to concentrated factor indices, as it were, rather than diversified indices. They will be more pertinent to use the diversified indices mm -hmm. to yes, avoid the, the crowding risk. Yeah. Of course, to avoid crowding. Okay. Um, another question that we just got through was, um, says this, your results hold an average across six factors. So how about the individual factors? Yes, okay. So, so effectively, what I've um, discussed here mm. were just results that show the results we get on average. Mm -hmm. Um, across these six factors. So we actually implement um, these tests for these six different factors individually, and so what I've shown is just kind of the average, um, you know, uh, implementation mm -hmm. measures you get, the, the, the average risk return measures. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a uh, good question. So do these results only hold on average, or, you know, do they also hold for each of the factors that we test? So um, we actually, um, you know, publish these, um, these, these results, mm -hmm. also for the individual um, factors and what you can see actually is that, um, you know, this holds quite consistently um, across the six different factors. Um, so this improvement, for example, that you get through equal weighting, mm. um, actually holds across the different factors that that we test. Um, kind of the only slight exception is um, the, the the size tilt. So if you look at the size tilt, we actually have a result that shows that um, using either equal weighting or cap weighting doesn't create much difference in, in performance. Um, that's quite intuitive because if you hold um, a portfolio that tilts towards the, the smaller stocks in, in a standard index universe, so mm -hmm. these are basically the, the mid-caps, the smaller stocks in the, in the larger mid-cap universe, um, well, if you do that, uh, you're not that far from an equal-weighted portfolio. So kind of by construction, you're not going to be very different. Okay. Uh, but clearly, broadly speaking, across the six factors, you know, the results hold quite, quite smoothly. Okay. Um, and, and also the lack of benefits of concentrating more hold quite consistently across all of the six factors. Okay, right. and sort of moving on from that, um, just a last question. Well, why did you use the diversified multi-strategy approach, uh, bringing together the five different strategies rather than individual weighting schemes? Okay, so we, we, we were really just looking for a proxy for you know, a weighting scheme that targets that diversification. Okay. And of course, there's many different weighting schemes that try to do that. Um, in the base case, we used equal weighting not because you know, we thought that it would have any particular benefits, mm -hmm. uh, but simply because um, by using the simplest version, if you will, of a, of a well-diversified portfolio, um, you, know, you can have a, a useful base case, um, and then you can see whether results will hold also for more, if you will, sophisticated strategies, more, more complicated strategies. Uh, but if really, um, you know, there, there, there is uh, a strong case uh, 
for using a well diversified uh, strategy, mm -hmm. then you know even the simplest of well diversified strategies should should deliver results. So we actually took equal weighting as kind of a very um, you know simple uh, and kind of straightforward to to implement approach. Um, now. As a, a second proxy, we also used this diversified multi-strategy approach. Mm -hmm. Now, the diversified multi-strategy approach actually has kind of two types of uh, benefits. Um, the, the, the first type is that it is a, a proxy for a well-diversified strategy, so you're not going to end up being concentrated in individual stocks. Mm -hmm. You're going to be diversified across this uh, firm-specific risk. Uh, but additionally, you're also not making the choice of a particular weighting scheme. So by actually combining these five different weighting schemes, mm -hmm. You're actually also, um, you know, diversifying the strategy-specific risks. You're not, if you will, betting on, you know, having the best diversification model or the okay. best methodology, but you're actually diversifying uh, across them. Uh, and so this is quite a common sense approach um, to actually get a, a meaningful proxy for a diversification approach. Um, and, and so this is why we chose the, the diversified multi-strategy approach. Okay, great. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. So uh, we'll have to conclude the webinar. Thank you for sharing your insights, Felix. Uh, we hope our viewers have found this informative. If we were not able to address questions now, we will be sure to respond to you by email. Um, if you have further questions, please do send them to us at webinar at scientificbeta.com. We've also published a paper on this topic called Diversified or Concentrated Factor Tilts, uh, which features in the last winter issue of the Journal of Portfolio Management. It's available on our website, www.scientificbeta.com and we will send you the link uh, to access it along with the replay of this webinar and you can also download the slides in the presentation. And lastly, if you do not follow us already on social media, we are on LinkedIn and our Twitter handle is at scientificbeta. So that concludes today's presentation. Thank you and goodbye.